All right, we're live. Good evening, folks. Hey, Andy Tran here with Interbark, and I'm here with Wingman115 to talk about my new knife by Topps Knives called the Tahoma Field Knife. So I think most people are pretty familiar with your channel. Do you want to quickly go over what you sort of do over there? Um, I'm kind of a cornucopia of YouTube, uh, <laughs> all mixed into one. Um, I love outdoor videos. I love doing knife reviews. Uh, I'm heavy in air guns. Uh, I'm not uh, an internet Rambo, so I don't. Do, I have an AR, but I don't do a lot of the AR shooting. There's a lot more people qualified than me out there. But uh, the big thing about my channel is I like to have fun, and I like to share those experiences with you, the viewer and subscriber. And it's just a pleasure to uh, make videos and people watch them. Sweet. And you just did a video on a new air pistol, right? For carbon. Yeah, yeah I um, bought myself a uh, early Christmas present, and uh, I was out playing around with it yesterday. Uh, I like pre-charged pneumatic, and that's high-pressure air, uh, air, air guns. And uh, I bought a new one from Benjamin called the uh, Marauder. And uh, I'll be doing showcasing that soon. I did a little sneak peek, first impressions yesterday of it up in the woods. Uh, it's fun times getting out there. Cool. Awesome. Well, I'm really glad to have you here. I've been watching your channel for quite a while, probably the last couple of years, and you've been doing this a little bit longer than I have. So, yeah, great to have you here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang out on the YouTube page. So I encourage all you folks, if you have questions for Andy about his knife, and later on we'll open it up, open forum questions about the channel. Uh, just keep it clean. Don't get crazy out there. I'll monitor that, and I will forward those questions uh, over to Andy about it. Yeah, and a quick reminder, because this is new to me too, but there's about a 30-second delay in when you guys start to hear stuff, so you know, hang tight for those responses. Cool. Okay. Um, so I encourage all you folks. Oh, I'm double feeding here. I'm learning this. I um have a have like a little interview. I'm gonna be like the David Frost of uh, knife reviews, I guess. And uh, I'm gonna be Nixon, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a criminal. <laughs> The, the first question uh, that I have is, um, how did you get started in designing and making knives? Uh, well, I've, this isn't the first knife that I made. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, I was really into the outdoors. And I, my, the first knife that I'd ever gotten, I was about seven years old. My dad gave me um, a Buck Hunter. I think it's model 110. But, um, you know, I've always carried a knife with me. And, you know, I, I was kind of naturally always like a knife junkie, so uh, I've always wanted like the next biggest, baddest knife, but I could never really afford it. And so I've always looked at Tops Knives as being like the end all, most awesome knives um, because of like the Tom Brown tracker and all that stuff. But being that I couldn't afford them, uh, I was never able to get one myself, but my dad had a really sweet metal shop. So when I was in middle school, you know, while other kids were playing soccer and that sort of thing. Um, I was in my backyard and in my dad's metal shop, you know, cutting out, like, some flat bar and grinding it down and bringing it back into the backyard to put them in a fire and harden them and temper them and all that stuff. So that's kind of where it all started. And uh, I did a couple knives in high school, and, you know, that was kind of it. And then I haven't made one for a while. I've made a couple, but... This is definitely the one that uh, I was really proud of because I put all of the features that I liked about other knives and other features that were on my other knives that really succeeded, and then I kind of just merged it into one package. So, What, what, what sort of steel uh, did you use Like when you were in high school? Did you play with 1095, or did you mess around with stainless? Or I messed a little bit around with stainless. It was not my favorite material to work with because... It's rather hard to temper and, and sharpen, and, um, you know, I was using, like, 420 stainless steel, which is not that great of a material to work with anyway. 
but my favorite stuff to work with was either like you know uh, leaf springs from a car. Oh, cool. Or, yeah, or uh, I think I made one out of an old flat bar pry bar, and so that was pretty robust. But yeah, and I think uh, when I was in middle school, one of the kids actually bought one of my knives. So it was like this big Rambo looking type thing. Uh, I don't know what happened to that, but it was pretty cool. Hey, that's now a collector's item. Yeah. Or exactly. soon to be a big time collector's item. Yeah. Well, that's pretty awesome. Now, um, your knife is named the Tahoma. Yep. Um, can you tell us a little bit how that came about? Well, uh, I live in Washington State, and Washington State is known for, well, Mount St. Helens for one, but I think mainly Mount Rainier. And Mount Rainier is kind of the, the settler's name for uh, Mount Tahoma. So that's kind of where that came from. And growing up, you know, I could look out my, my window and I could see Mount Rainier staring at me. So whenever I'm in school and I wanted to be anywhere else but in school, that's what, you know, kind of what I thought about. So Yeah, that was a tough view to look at, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, it's a teaser. Yeah, but, no doubt. Yeah, but I can, you know, visit any time now that I'm not in school and, you know, play hooky for life. So the Tahoma, that's made out of 1095, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, Marie on in the um, YouTube page has a question. She wants to know, what is the Rockwell of the Tahoma? Most top knives are 56 to 58, and this one is pretty much the same. And, you know, this is a production prototype, so it doesn't, doesn't look anything like the ones that are actually on Top's website right now for sale. But, um, you know, with the, the finish that we put on it in the process, you can really see the hard edge versus the soft spine. So, you know, when people are like, oh, why, why do Top's knives cost that much? Um, I tell them, well, it's differentially tempered, and that's very hard to find in a production knife, and it's what makes them so robust. But you know, uh, 56, 58 on the edge. Just so folks know, uh, I have a lot of Topps knives, and I'm pretty hard on their knives. I can attest to the Rockwell uh, rating. You know, I have a Hawks Hellion. You know, I have, uh, gosh, I can't even remember the names here, the American Trailmaker. I mean, I, I got a bunch of them, and they're, you're not going to break these knives. I mean, if you're doing some destruction test, driving over them with a freaking tank, but besides that, I mean, it, they're, they are stout blades, and I can attest to that. Yeah, and, and honestly, I think the only time I've heard about a Topps knife failing was when uh, Adam Francis was doing one of the testing on one of their knives, and it was just, you know, a bad temper job, and it bent. Yeah. Um, but once Tops got a hold of that, they just sent him a brand new one, no questions asked, like, you know, within six hours. So, um. Well, that, that's one of the advantages by having your design made by a well-respected company like Tops because you're going to have a guarantee on that knife. Yeah. I mean, one, they build it, I mean, freaking bomb-proof to begin with, and then you have a great, um, they have a great reputation and they stand behind their stuff. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the company is veteran owned and operated, so I think all of the people that work there have some sort of military background. So you know you're not getting some you know immigrant or something like that that doesn't really know what's going on working on these things. These are all people that have used their knives in service, you know, either retired or whatever got out of service and still wanted to you know, keep that legacy going. So everyone that works there um, knows the importance of having a really good blade. So that's a, a big thing about it is passion. If you're not passionate about what you, you do, you're not going to produce a good product. Okay, here's, here's a question I had. Now, Topps knives traditionally are a quarter-inch thick. I mean, i got a ton of them that are quarter-inch thick. Yep. Your blade is three-sixteenths of an inch. Mm-hmm. Please, please explain to some of the folks watching why you chose that width of a blade. Well, it's simple physics and 
mathematics pretty much. And um, when you have a thicker blade, you're you have a really thick grind, and what happens there is uh, you get a lot less sliceability, but a lot of good splitting. And so, three sixteenths is a really good kind of gray zone, I guess, where you can have that really good sliceability of say you know like a one eighth inch. Wow. And good splitting ability of a quarter inch. So, you know, if you've ever tried to split wood with a machete, you know that it just kind of sticks there and just all the friction just wraps around the blade and it's not good. But um, if you've ever split wood with an axe, you'll know that, you know, the wide bit will just open apart the wood and, and you're ready to go for the next piece. So, this was a really good balance of sliceability, uh, splitability, and it was also something lightweight because I don't want to have a knife this big, quarter inch thick, on my belt when I already have a pistol or something else on my belt as well. No, I I would I would agree there because I mean I've I've used this knife here, the XCEST, and I mean that's that's a quarter inch of steel, and it's like you said the grind is so steep that one it's just hard to do a lot of bushcraft tasks with a campcraft tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a stout blade, but three sixteenths of an inch is a stout blade too. I mean, on the Hawks Hellion, which you and I have both tested, is three sixteenths of an inch. Right. And I mean, there's videos of Michael Hawk jamming this in and just standing on it and jumping on it. So, I mean, these blades are going to hold up. I mean, that's that, that's not a problem at all. And trying to sharpen it out in the field. I mean, a quarter inch of steel is hard to sharpen. Yeah, but uh, with with that uh, with that steeper grind, though, it is harder to dull it. So that is kind of a trade-off. But you know, if, if there's only so much you can sharpen a pry bar, essentially. But yeah, at, as a combat knife, I could I could see those attributes being a positive thing. Yeah. Definitely. Um, but as a field craft, camp craft, bushcraft knife, I I think you found the sweet spot with that length of blade. Now the total length of the blade is uh, how long, Andy? I have the exact number written down. Uh, it's just under 14 inches, though. I think officially it comes down, yeah, 13 inches and 5 sixteenths. Okay. So um, I'm not really sure how that happened with that kind of weird fraction, but I think it was kind of how I made it. But they, they're pretty true to the form that I originally sent off to them. Well, the, that so they stayed pretty close to the prototype that you sent them? Yep, yeah, I mean, I had the first prototype, which I did a video on, which a lot of people saw, and right. then I did another prototype, which actually broke due to a bad heat treat, which is why I do not manufacture these myself, that's why Tops is doing it. Um, and that one broke, so I wasn't able to send down that one. But I sent them my first prototype and told them the differences I made between the first and the second. They took that to heart, put it in there, and then they sent me a production prototype. And then from there, I was like, well, there's like, you know, three or four changes I want to make. Most of them were cosmetic, and then they were like, okay, we'll send it over. And, uh, yeah, I couldn't be happier with how it turned out. So... Why don't we w explain to folks um, some of the features of the knife and uh, why you designed it the way it did, primarily like the angle of the handle and how it's going to fit in your hand and work for you. Sure. Well, um, the tip is a spear tip, so you know it's sharpened on both edges. And for people that live like in Australia, you're not allowed to have a sharpened edge at the top. Uh, tops will later on have an option to have this non-sharpened so that it can go through customs and then I'm not going to advise that you sharpen it, but you could sharpen it. Um, but the reason why I wanted to have a sharpened tip was say you doled this entire blade you know, during you know, two weeks out without a sharpener because you forgot it or lost it or whatever and you have no way of making an improvised sharpening device because there's no rocks or anything like that around. Well, you still have a last-ditch resort in order to do this. 
Um, also, what this does is say you have uh, an animal you need to kill, and you're just going to sever its spinal cord or something like that, or you're hunting boar, and you really need to pierce that sort of hard armor plate that they have behind the shoulder. This is really going to go into the animal quickly and effectively and, and just finish the job. So that was a big reason for me to have it. Um, on the spine of the blade, this one has a non-finished tooth, but it's going to have sort of an angled tooth. So if you have a bone or a piece of material that you want to you know, break and split, you can take your edge and just kind of make a little bit of a notch on it and then take either this part of the spine or this part of the spine and smack it. And so that weak point will pretty much break exactly where you want it to go. Oh, that's, and, pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and also, it's really good for... Uh, I made it deeper on the front one, so you can work hard in like a piece of uh, wire or barbed wire or something like that and then break it so you don't need pliers. Um, and that's, that's sort of reminiscent of a lot of military knives because that's a pretty important thing to have. So you can make snares and all that stuff out of things that you find out there or out of existing materials that you already have. Plus, I've seen like guys like Ron Hood uh, also use the notch cut in the blade. He, all, he never carried a cook kit, always used a, a, a number 10 tin can with a coat hanger and lift it right out of the fire with the notch on the blade. Exactly, yeah, and I have a, a pot, which is not really right, right next to me. But, yeah, you can, you know, just take the little tiny wire, hook it in there, and then pull it out without having to use a stick or something like that. It's a lot sexier to do with something like this. Um, the thumb ramp, I put a little hole in there, and that's exactly lined up with the finger choil. Part of the reason why I didn't put it uh, the, the thumb ramp a little bit further back, like you see on a lot of knives, is, one, because I wanted it, when you hold it, to... Um, to work a little better with your hand. Because when you have it back here, it kind of angles your knife out like that. Right. And so it's not exactly comfortable for the kind of work I wanted to do with it. And it also adds a little bit of material where this finger troll is cutting out. So you still have a lot of strength right there, which if any part of the knife was weak, it would be there. So it's a little bit of reinforcement. Um, the hole is going to be, uh, so you need to pull a bullet out to use the gunpowder as tinder, like you would on the Brothers Bushcraft knife, uh, which is a pretty sweet feature. You can also do a, uh, a lanyard hole right here. So for people that do uh, cutting competitions and that sort of thing, it's pretty common to see a lanyard lashed up front versus back here because if you accidentally lose a knife, it's not going to be swinging by the back. It's going to be pretty much in your hand, just loose. Um, and then it also helps with lashing it to a spear and that sort of thing. And uh, the angle is of the of the handle to the knife blade. It was a little bit of experimenting on my part, um, and that was a pretty critical thing. And I wanted to have a knife that was straight enough so it's not awkward when you're doing carving and that sort of task. But I wanted it curved enough and at an angle enough where um, where the angle of the swing and where your material would be in, re in relation to your body height, you would have the most speed and energy. So it's, it's really made for chopping efficiency. Then the handle shape is kind of, uh, is actually really ergonomic. And the way I came up with that is one day I was eating a banana and I was holding it in my hand. And I was like, man, this banana feels comfortable in the hand because it's, you know, just slightly curved and it just kind of fits the hand perfectly. So I kind of played with that idea and kind of came up with that handle shape. Of course, we got bow drill spindle sockets on both sides for right or left hand. And a lot of people are like, well, why would you need it on both sides? Well, if you're not using a sheath with it, you know, you can have the blade facing away from your body. Right. And how you're holding it. So you don't want any of that stuff pointing... Uh, towards your leg, because these knives are pretty darn sharp, and they'll, they'll cut you pretty darn good. And then at the back, we have a pry bar and a lanyard hole, and I position the pry bar so that when you're chopping and you're holding this in sort of like a backseat configuration, it's not going to dig into the meat of your hand. So, yeah. And also, what's really cool about this handle shape is that when you're going for a backseat grip, it goes from pretty much straight like that to that, which actually curves the blade into a more efficient 
chopping geometry. So it's uh, kind of these cool built-in features that I didn't really intend, but they worked out really good in the end. That was one of the features that kind of like piqued my interest because how many times do you hear folks, you know, say, man, I broke the tip off my knife because I was prying open this or that. Yeah, you know? exactly. And now, and now you've totally taken that equation out of there, especially mm -hmm. the last thing you need to do when you're out in the woods, break the tip off your knife trying to pry something open. Yeah, yeah, and that stuff is uh, is not covered by, you know, the legendary tops warranty because uh, people should know better. But it's also, you know, kind of sharp, uh, sharp enough that you can make kind of like a pilot hole for when you're making a bow drill or, or a hand drill or something like that. So well, One thing I like, Andy, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, go on. Is that it's reminiscent of, like, the hoodlum, and I like the way that at least on my hoodlum, I like the way that I can choke up on the blade to do that fine work. And you've adopted that with your knife. I know that you know you're sitting there making uh, figure four traps or deadfall traps or whatever out in the bush. You know you want to be able to get in there to be able to notch and do that fine detail. And yep. that's to me that's a nice feature to have on there. Yeah, and you know there's another way to grip these that. I don't think anyone ever really did, but uh, like for when I was field dressing a deer just a few weeks ago, was really good. Is uh, when you have your hands up in the guts and the and the chest cavity, is you can hold it like this, and then you have a lot more control because there's not so much blade going around, and so uh, you put your pinky right there in the finger tool, and it keeps your hand from sliding towards the blade. So you get a lot more control to you know for when you're doing some blind work inside of an animal. But, uh, yeah, it's a really good feature to have. Hey, I have a couple of uh, viewer questions. What's up? Uh, this is from Miss Lenny XO, and it says, I saw a lot of mixed feelings about the sheath on Top's Facebook page. What's your thoughts on that? And later on, is there going to be different sheath options? Yeah, uh, so for this knife, I decided to go with a ballistic sheath, and... There are a lot of mixed feelings about these, but the good thing that I really like about them is that aside from being able to mount it on your Molly hardware or whatever on your belt, it has a really generous pocket on the front, and the pocket was really my selling point on it because I'm able to put a full-size you know, hand sharpener in there along with a fire starter and everything like that, and these are things that I also have in my pocket, but to have something as well, uh, you know, as a backup inside of the knife sheath is really good. So um, that was pretty much my reason behind that. And you put a whole survival kit in there. Pretty much. I mean, my my philosophy is, and this is a big fear, and it's happened to me before. If you fall in a river and shit is falling out of your pockets, or you have to ditch your backpack, I want you to have the option to have at least a little something to you know give you a fighting chance. Yeah. So. That was pretty much my intent on that. And uh, in the future, in the very near future, I'm going to be having uh, a fellow from Regalia Innovations doing some Kydex for it. And if you look on my channel, he, in my online store, he does the uh, SOG Northwest Ranger sheath and the, uh, the Fire Starter sheath, which I actually have in my pocket. But um, if I can get it out... But he so, makes. Really see, I get excited about Kydex. I'm. I, I got to put it out there. I'm a Kydex fanboy. I just. Yeah. I just love Kydex. Well, I mean, the guys at Regalia Innovations. Like, if I ask for something, and it. I mean, it. And it, hopefully, it makes sense. I'm not like drunk texting or something like that. Right. But if it makes sense, like this, I had a lot of input on the design of this sheath. Um, you know, they're gonna make it. They're gonna make it perfect. The Kydex on it is thick. The positive lock on it's really good. He really knows how to fasten their hardware, and so you know he's always making new things. And he's going to be making the sheaths for the uh, for the Tahoma field knife. And he also has the option of getting you know like multi cam, ATAX, all those specialty camos. Um, so you can get pretty much anything under the sun that you would ever want. And uh, yeah, and and 
it's going to lock pretty solid too. So eventually that'll be available through your website? Yep, yep. And they're going to be made one by one like all the other sheets that he does. So, you know, if there's any special thing that you need, it might cost a little bit more, but he's going to be able to produce that in-house and exactly to, you know, your desires. But, um, yeah, he does great work. Really appreciate what he does. Uh, yeah, I love Kydex. I mean, I can't rave about it enough. Yeah. Another question, this is from Knife and Guns. Uh, he's curious, where where is the center point balance on the knife? That is a good question. It's a little bit front heavy. It's, it's obviously a big blade. Um, the center point is going to be right about at the finger toil. So, That's you know, for doing a little bit of fine chopping that sort of thing. Doing this is going to be easy to do, but uh, chopping is where it's really going to be at. And, uh, yeah, it's just awesome. And uh, the the balance point for this knife is going to be a little bit further forward, just slightly, because the production models actually have a red liner underneath the handle scales. But that's only going to move it maybe a quarter inch from where this one is. What does the red liner do? Kind of make it watertight, or no? Nah, just sex, just sex appeal. Um, <laughs> I didn't have to put it in there, but the red liners look really good with the uh, the tan canvas handle scales. So, um, you know, a lot of people are like, "Well, I don't really care what my knife looks like." Well, as well, I do. You know, because if I'm going to be stopped by a police officer for having this on my belt, I want to be able to whip out something that's pretty. And uh, you know. And I'm sure the liners actually do add a little bit more of like a gasket type seal to it. Yeah, I I have a couple. Uh, I know the Hawks Hellion has liners on it. Looks pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I think most Tops knives has it actually. Yeah, I think so. Get it up to the cam, people can see. So, plus in that Micarta too. Once you uh, start using it as a bow drill, it's just going to get polished in there and work really well. Yeah, it just gets better and better. Um, and I don't think you're ever going to wear through it. And the cool thing about the, the canvas micarta versus, you know, like the the hoodlum, or the, not the hoodlum, but the uh, the Ron Hood Atax right. that, that has a spindle on the metal is that it doesn't transfer heat very well. So if you're going at it for a while, the heat's not going to transfer into your hand and burn you. Like it would hey, hey, Andy, I challenge somebody to wear it out. That means they're using the knife. Yeah, and I think the more you use a knife like a Topps knife and the more you break it down and everything like that, it, I think it just looks better and better. It's kind of like a good pair of jeans. So, um, yeah. I dare someone to wear it out. You'd have to be working, you know, three fires every day for the next ten years for you to go through that. Big time. Now, uh, the finish on the blade... Can you explain to folks, uh, you did, we didn't do the traditional finish like Topps does, right? Right. Um, are they clear coating it, or are they just leaving it the way it is? And what does somebody have to do to, one, you're in the Pacific Northwest, so the conditions are a lot different than me down here in San Diego County where it's l really low humidity. You know, with 1095 carbon steel, I mean, you really got to uh, – Couple put some more. sort of corrosion uh, resistant lubricant on there. Uh, is there a clear coat on the blade or? Well, the the blade finish is called Black River Wash, and this is a, a coating that they developed this past year. I think the first knife that they put it on was a Tex Creek knife, and uh, the second knife they put it on is a Tex Creek XL, which is just a little bit, I think, two inches longer than that one. But essentially, what it is is. Um, they do a special process to bring out the actual hard lines so it's a little bit darker. And then they add uh, a clear Cerakote on it. So it's actually clear ceramic coating that's on top of the blade. So, you know, anyone that is familiar with the Cerakote firearms coatings, they know that they're the best in the industry. I think uh, the closest second they have is Duracote, but even Duracote, I think, is as far as abrasion goes and saltwater tests, it was like, it, it tapped out one-fifth of the way that really? the Cerakote would go through. Yeah, I mean, it's freaking nuts. So um, we're, we're talking space-age 
technology being used on here, basically. Essentially, that's what it is. So, you know, you can go on the uh, Cerakote website, and they'll go through, you know, the saltwater tests, and this thing will last, like, you know, three months in a really harsh, salty environment where everything else passed, you know, five days later. Right. Um, the abrasion test, it lasts, like, ten times longer than the nearest competitor or whatever. So when they said that they used a the clear Cerakote, I was like, boom, that's it, that's what I want. And uh, there's no going back from that. I, I think that, you know, the, the benefits that you have from it is really good. It takes a little bit longer to produce a knife using it, but um, I think, you know, the, the benefit is way up there. And, uh, you know, on all my knives from Tops, or any knife that I have, actually, you know, where I, where I baton and chop with it most, it always wears through, but yeah. with a coat, no, we're going to be fine. No, that's awesome. I, now, I know that Chris had prepared mine. First thing he does is he strips off the coating on the knife down to bare metal. I mean, it. I I like that feature of having just a bare metal old school blade. Now, I can understand if you're an operator, you know, special operations, you're deploying, you don't want something that's going to get a lot of shine, but the philosophy of use of your knife is field craft, camp craft, bush craft, survival knife, I mean, so it's going to appeal to that community that doesn't need that black uh, finish on there where you're not worried about shine. Matter of fact, as a survival knife, you might want a knife that shines uh, if you say you don't have a survival mirror in. It's a daylight and you have planes flying over, maybe you can get some shine off that. Mm -hmm. plane sees it, hey, it might make the difference of being rescued or a long walk home, uh, you know. Yeah. Just and different the, things to think about on that. The Cerakote is not a super high gloss finish. I think they're actually using more of a matte finish Cerakote, but uh, I definitely like the way that it looks on the blade. I kind of like classic designs because right. they just don't go out of style. Um, you know, and black is cool, but, you know, I like a pretty knife instead. And hey, uh, Marie has a uh, question about... Can you get different scales? Now, I know on Topps Knives, you, sometimes you can get the Rocky Mountain scales. You can get, they, they have like an a la carte menu. Mm -hmm. Will that be available for the Tahoma as well? or? You know, I foresee that being a possibility. Right now, because it's such a new knife, um, having those options is kind of difficult. But I see in the future, definitely. And, you know, a lot of people are, mainly wanting the black linen micarta like I have on, on this one. Yeah. And so for and those are the most of the guys that like the black track encoding and that sort of thing. So uh, that will probably be a feature down the road. And uh, and yeah. And I didn't want to have a Rocky Mountain tread because, you know, after eight hours of using the knife, there's a good chance for having hot spots in your hand. And uh, you're, you're right about that. I'll pull this knife out real quick because I have this one I keep on a, a load-bearing vest, and I have that Rocky Mountain tread. And I took this on a Sierra Mountain backpacking trip, and I was just thrashing this knife. And my <laughs> hands were hurting after like an hour of me – I mean, it looks cool, you know, like your Chuck Norris. In it's this grippy as hell. But uh, when you're out in the woods and you're sweating, I mean, my, my palm was hurting after a while. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's originally designed, I mean, Topps Knives, it's born out of the military. So these guys are not using their knife for very long. They're using it to get a job done, like, you know, cut this, cut that, stab this person, slice that person. So you're not using it for that long, and most of the time you're going to be wearing gloves anyway. Right. So to have that, like, basically, uh, you know, it is it Rocky Mountain Tread, to have that huge amount of grip, no slip whatsoever, is really important in those situations. For a bushcraft scenario, it would be great to have that sort of grip, but the consequence of having that much uh, texture on your hands is is not beneficial. Well, the cool thing about having micarta, the sweat from your hand is going to make that scales grippier on there. Yeah, yeah, and, and the way that works is, you know, the micarta is made using, well, uh, like a fabric. So when you get these wet, the fibers in the fabric swell and expand. So that's how, you, that, how that works. Hey, I have another question, and this comes from Knife and Guns. 
He says, when using the backup edge, how do you recommend holding the knife? Well, it's everything's going to be a compromise. So you're going to have a lot of leverage on your hand, but you're just going to have to you know, go as close as you can and start using the knife. Um, I don't see someone doing brain surgery, so the amount of control that you're going to have is going to be a little bit less. Um, you can also hold it like this if you're doing some small, finer tasks, but, um, you know, this it's really just a last-ditch effort, and having, you're not going to have the full control as if you were using the full main edge. So it's really just a last-ditch effort. So you can hold it like this, or, you know, you can hold it like this, sort of. And that's a good thing about not having a bunch of saw teeth in the back is that you can hold right. it on the spine. So... Yeah, I, I would agree uh, with you there because, you know, we both own the Hawks Hellion, and right. that would be not a good attribute on the Hawks Hellion to hold the knife like that, mm -hmm. you know, with, with that with that the chainsaw. The teeth are sharp. Knife. But, uh, you know, I could see if you're doing, if you're into doing uh, bow drills or hand drills, you know, like you demonstrated on one of your videos. Right. Awesome for making a divot, you know, almost like almost like a like a tonneau blade would be mm -hmm. sticking it in there. And me, per, it's a personal preference. And everybody watching, you know, you have to understand that. And I always say this on my videos: knives are like eating pizza, and everybody likes different things on their pizza. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to find what you like. Um, I like having the tip in line. With the handle, that's just one of my one of my geeky knife geek things that I like doing. I, that way, if you're making a bow drill, it's straight down. You you're just doing tasks, and they're and they're right on. Mm -hmm. uh, I like unique profile blades. Um, this is one of those knives that I, I'm very intrigued by. You did a great job designing this knife. Yeah, and I designed everything to work well with each other. I didn't want one feature impeding the, the effectiveness of another feature and I wanted everything to be ergonomic and sort of instinctual to people because I just want to be able to show them that their features are there. I don't want to really necessarily show them how to use it. So having it instinctual, making it feel like an extension of the body was really um, you know, one of my main goals. Right. Uh, just me asked how you, how you did the name of the knife. Uh, I'm going to suggest to him this video will be posted on Andy's um, uh, YouTube page, and he explains it in really good detail at the beginning of the uh, video. So I'm I'm sorry if we don't answer it right away for you. Uh, Thanks, for just that he already I'm covered on. that. Yeah. Um, Marie's wondering if they're going to have. Uh, let me see. She likes the Micarta scales. I just like tan with red lines better than black. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, it yeah. gives a little something different out there. And it's also easy to see if you drop it. You know, that's true. That's a consideration. I don't have to deal with snow, you know, like you guys do up there. Mm -hmm. Or you drop your knife even in tall grass. You know, then you don't find it until fall or spring, if you're right. lucky. Yeah. And one thing that you can do is, you know, you can always have, like, a, a neon orange lanyard or something like that. And that'll be a little beacon of hope to find your knife, if that should ever happen. So, Especially uh, if you're going out in the snow. That's a good point. Growing up in northern Maine, uh, we always used to get that surveyor's tape. And we yeah, used to right. tie that to all our gear in the wintertime because we'd go on these winter camperies and scouts and stuff. And, hey, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me, right? I'm going to drop something. And I would, it would be nice when you got that little bit of orange sticking out, you can find it. Another reason to put a lanyard on your knife and use your lanyard. Yeah, so you're not throwing it off into the woods or something like that. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're chopping. Yeah. You're chopping and it's dusk and it's a survival situation. You don't have a headlamp or some sort of illuminating device and now all of a sudden your blade's gone. Yeah, yeah, and and I always advise that when you're using a big knife or an axe or anything like that is you form a blood circle 
twice the distance of what is normally required so that you're not, you know, hurting someone. Because that, that last thing I want to see, especially with my knife, is, you know, something on the headlines where someone got stabbed in an accident in the woods and, you know, during survival training would be ridiculous. Oh, yeah. If it, if it can happen, it will happen, and especially in a situation where if it's an emergency, you know, I, t I teach emergency preparedness with the scouts, and, you know, you're going to do things that you would never think that you would do, that mistakes are going to happen. And that's why, I, you know, just like when I, I was in the military, we always used to say, you train until you fail, and then you learn from that. Because in a, in a controlled environment, yeah, it's good to learn the skills in the garage, you know, doing this and that, but out in the woods, you get, things are going to happen to you mm -hmm. that you would never think of. So There's a lot of distractions to keep your mind off the task at hand. That's yeah. Pretty. Yeah, you're amped up, adrenaline's flying because whatever the situation, somebody may be hurt and you're trying to affect a rescue. And you, adrenaline's pumping, you're not thinking right. Great point about the blood circle and all that because a lot of times we get out in the woods, we don't think about that and we're flailing around and people are near us and, I have absolutely seen a lot of YouTube videos where someone's chopping something with a large blade and their buddy with the camera is way too close. And uh, and I hope that they learn from that. Or actually, I hope they don't learn from that. I hope someone else tells them and then they think about it and then, you know, they never do it again. Yeah, they, they may get um, a shave, a close shave on that. Yeah, if they're lucky. Um, but, you know... And a thing about like distractions and stuff like that, just being cold, you know, trying to rush to do something is yeah. enough to really mess up your time, especially now that it's actually winter time. Um, you know, I, I've been caught doing that, you know, trying to rush to get to something, and it's it's really important just to, you know, what I do instead of shivering and, and trying to rush is I tense up my body really big and then just relax, take a deep breath, and then just go at things really slowly. So that... Uh, definitely makes it more effective when you're trying to do something, especially like lighting a fire, or starting a stove, putting up a tent. You know, those are fine motor skills that are really important to your survival. Hey, Just Me 234 has a great question. He wants to know, how long did the design process take you? And he's talking about blade design, color, logo, etching, and how much testing did you do to make it the what what you call the perfect knife. The whole process probably took about a year, and that was from the time I decided to make a knife like this to now when it's actually coming out on the market. And so um, I think one of this was the process of it, how I came about. Um, it was just a lot of trial and error. I, I did two prototypes. One of them broke, like I said. And, uh, you know, while I, I was shaping this knife and making it from a drawing into an actual solid thing that I could hold and swing around, um, you know, things are going to deviate from the picture. You know, like this little thing uh, was actually just a slip of hand that, you know, I cut in a little bit too deep, and then I was like, all right, well, I'll just go with it. And then I shaved it down perfectly, and then I held it, and I was like, well, this actually worked a lot better than the way I originally I drew it out. So little things like that, you know, just making it go forward. Um, the coding was pretty easy to figure out what I wanted. Um, I met with Mike Fuller, the CEO of Tops, and Leo, the shop manager at Tops, in Idaho a few months ago, and uh, met them or met Mike for the first time, met Leo again, shook their hands, they showed me what they had for coatings, and I was like, that's exactly what I want. It was pretty much a look for a sight type thing. Um, the etching that is done is actually made by my girlfriend, she's a graphic designer, and I showed her a picture of Mountain Rainier that I really liked, you know, sent her that, left her to her own demise, said that, you know, it's going to be a laser etching, you need to take away a lot of the detail, because it's not you know, a charcoal drawing or anything like that. And uh, she came up with that design. And Tops was able to put it right on the blade and make it perfect. Um, 
the handle scales, I decided to make them tan because I wanted them closer to what my original prototype was, which was uh, kind of like a, a faux micarta that was made out of some old Carhartt pants that I had that had a big rip in, in the side. So um, that was that. And what was the other part of the question? Uh, how much testing did you do to make it perfect? There was a lot of testing. Um, you know, my first prototype, I did a video on that, and uh, before I actually filmed the video, I probably put a good few hours with the materials and the terrain that I had just in my backyard. So I made sure that everything was at the right angle, made sure that um, the temper was good on it and everything. And then once I sent that over to Tops, they, you know, de-engineered it, made me a perfect model a few months later, which is one of the production prototypes. And with this knife, the first thing that I went and did with it was I filmed the, uh, the hand drill method of starting a fire. And so that was a lot of fine carving. Uh, and actually later that day after I filmed that, I wanted to harvest a lot of um, teepee poles. And teepee poles, you know, are about this thick at the base. And so I needed about 20 of them. So I went to dead standing trees. They're not green, so it's a little bit harder to chop through. And so I found the perfect ones. I chopped those all. I delimbed them all. And then I debarked and then, you know, smoothed them out, smoothed it all like the little knots and little things that were coming out. So that was actually about a 12-hour day of using my knife pretty much nonstop. And, uh, and that's just the big day. And then I just do a lot of little things like, you know, field dressing deer and that sort of thing. <coughs> so with this knife, I was able to skin the deer. Um, we were able to cut the sternum of a deer to get into the lungs and the hearts and to cut that diaphragm out and get everything out of the deer. Um, then we were able to, oh, I was able to behead the deer really easily with this knife. Just three little hits with it and the head came off. Um, I was able to chop into the uh, into the skull to get into the brain cavity to get the, the brains out for brain tanning. So, you know, there's a lot of things that I did with this knife that I designed this knife for. So really testing out every single thing, making sure everything works, and making everything flow together and not impede on other features was um, was a big part of testing. Now, Did I answer that right? <laughs> it sounded pretty good to me. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I, I can, I'm afraid I went on a tangent, but I hope I, I answered everything all right. Did, now, a lot of guys make, like, cardboard cutouts. Did you, you do a cardboard cutout of yours? I did. Um, and actually, I have my original drawing. And this is actually on two different pieces of paper uh, because, you know, sometimes when I'm thinking I, I just want to draw something and I had just a bunch of paper, so that's actually two pieces of paper taped together. Um, and then my cardboard is this one. And, uh, yeah, so there were slight variations, you know, oh, to that's get... That's cool. Um, if you folks have any questions... Doesn't matter what the free for all question, throw it in the comments and we'll uh, do our best to uh, answer for you. Absolutely. And uh, I'm at home now. I think the last hangout I was at, I was actually traveling. I was in my uh, my girlfriend's dorm, so uh, <laughs> they, they wanted to talk a lot about equipment and gear and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, I can't really bring out my gun and all this stuff. I don't have my axe with me. All I had was my knife essentially and my boots and that's pretty much what I went with. Well, one of the guys, uh, 898, someone said, should have gone with G10. He doesn't like Micarta. But it's like we talked about, right? That mm -hmm. that pizza, that everybody likes different things on their pizza. Yeah. Um, it's just one of those things in the knife community. You're never going to get any all of us to agree on everything. Yeah. J just like in the gun community. It's going to be the same way. But, and uh, in the gun, in within that gun community, the uh, like the reloaders, the precision shooters, they're super anal and stubborn about everything. And I'm the same way, you know. Like if someone tells me, 
you know, something that doesn't really quite make sense. I've never tried before. I'm I'm very skeptical on, on doing that stuff. But uh, I Ooh. will say that my next knife that I'm going to be prototyping and that sort of thing is more likely than not going to have G10 just because of the uh, the what you're going to be using it for. So that's uh, that's all I can say about that. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a fan of both G10 and Micarta. I think they both have their place. Um, in some in some of the areas I've seen where they're putting G10 to possibly keep the cost down on a knife, you know, on, on certain knives. But, uh, you know, they, they each have a place in the knife community, and they have their pros and cons. So I'm... I'm a fan of both. It just depends on the knife. Uh, if it's a folder, you know, G G10's good on a folder. I mean, you know, you it works really. I, I have G10 scales on my Habilis Bush tool. I mean, it, it works really well. But I, I also have a ton with Micarta too, and they work really well. So it's they're they're both great materials. They yeah, are, and, really and I'm nice. sure someone is going to make some aftermarket grips for us that you can slap on and. Make it awesome. So, well, we yeah, I would. I hope your knife has a lot of success where people are building all sorts of add-ons for it. Yeah, it, it's a great looking blade. Yeah. Hey, and Marie yeah. has a question of: Would either channel consider doing a navigation how-to? I'm actually thinking of doing that. I had a lot of navigation experience, like outward bound navigating backcountry stuff. So, um, I'm just looking for uh, a compass that films well. Does that make sense? Like, it's easy to tell people what's what. How about you? Uh, I, I do navigation okay, but I like, to, I like to talk about things on my videos that I'm really, really confident in, and I know that there's a lot more people out there that do a better job at it than me, mm -hmm. and the YouTube community will let you know when you go when you're not a hundred percent sure on something. And I'm not not saying that I'm not, but there's better qualified folks out there that that can convey that thought onto video better than I can on that subject. Right, um, and uh, and that's a good point. You know, there's a there's a good thing and a bad thing about, you know, having, like, a screen name avatar. It's like, well, it's good because you can speak your mind, but it's bad because sometimes you speak your mind. And, uh, and yeah, that, that has pros and cons for two for sure. But, um, yeah, I might do a navigation one. I have experience navigating uh, on water, so with, you know, um, marine charts, and I have experience with topo maps as well, so... Um, yeah, I do like backcountry navigation, and I, I used to uh, sail competitively, so that that stuff is I know that stuff. Oh, that's cool. Now I I do geocaching, and I I carry a Silver Ranger compass. I mean I I did all that in the Scouts. I know how to do it, but it's like doing algebra. You either love doing algebra. Or, you know, uh, okay, I'll do it till I get through the class, right? Yeah, right. With, with navigating, is kind of the same way with me. It's like, oh, don't build me a clock. Tell me the time to get there. But that that's a great question, Marie. Uh, there's just a lot of folks doing it a lot better than I, than I can out there. And I I just don't want to – I don't want to come off looking like a – how do I say it? A dumbass, I guess, on YouTube. Right. Of course, I do silly, campy stuff anyway, and and Andy will tell you part of doing these channels, you can't take yourself too serious. You know, at the end of the day, I still have to take out the trash, and <laughs> you know, do whatever else the wife tells me to do. Oh and yeah. That segues into another question that Jess Me Two Thirty Four has. Says it sees that we have rings on our hands says that he's big into the uh, family and the outdoors and makes it a family event. He goes, is it something you and your family enjoy doing together? You want to go first on that one? Uh, sure. Um, I like doing a lot of camping. Uh, my wife is not, quote, a tent person. Uh, she doesn't like to rough it like that. that. That's not her cup of tea, and I respect that. Uh, 
I have a tent trailer. I do the family camping stuff. I mean, we've done Mount Shasta, Lake Siskiyou countless times, uh, Lake Tahoe. I mean, we've been all over the southwest uh, in NorCal uh, with our Coleman pop-up tent trailer. I mean, it's just awesome. I could ramble on for hours about that. Uh, great memories. Uh, I only have one daughter, but, I mean, my daughter loves camping uh, with me, and all the nieces and nephews, one thing I can say is they're all in their, I'm dating myself now, their mid-20s and early 30s, and whenever we have a family get-together, they always say, Uncle, I always remember when, and it's either a camping um, topic comes up or a hike or something. It's never been, gee, Uncle, I always remember when we played Xbox together. I mean, no one's going to remember that 10 exactly. years from now. But they're going to remember that time we went out and we saw this eagle come down and hit this ground squirrel on a stump as we pulled into the campground. I mean, that's something they're going to remember the rest of their life. So that's a great question about family. What about you, Andy? Um, well, I am pretty much the black sheep of my family, um, aside from my dad, which, you know, he wasn't – he was a, a big, huge part of my childhood growing up, and then he was not part of my life for a good long time. But, um, you know, I was kind of – the outcast of my family were I like to be outdoors. You know, my my mom was pretty much a, a rural living person when she was back in Vietnam. And my sister, you know, likes to go to the mall three times a week. So, uh, yeah, my family, I mean, are, are as far from the outdoors as you can get. My dad, on the other hand, he's the one that took me uh, fishing and camping and and taught me a lot of my survival skills, and uh, and I'm really lucky to have a girlfriend that likes the outdoors, and and mm -hmm. she really did help like rekindle my my love for firearms and and camping and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, you know, I I did a lot of camping with like a tarp without a tent, so I, you know I haven't used a tent for nearly seven years until. I started camping with my girlfriend, and she actually wanted a tent, so um, that's as that's as far as she'll go. I'm trying to wear her down to, you know, go into debris huts or um, or tarps or ponchos and and go light. But uh, you know, she's she's willing to carry her own tent, you know, because I already got a bunch of stuff, so I can't really complain. And uh, you know, I have a dog who, you know, both of us call him our son, and. He loves going filming, and you'll see him in the videos. And yeah, he's a good company. So most of the time, I go camping alone because uh, I like to go camping during the weekday, and I like going with zero comfort. I guess I like suffering a little bit. A lot of a lot of people don't realize that when we go out there and we film these videos, and Andy carries a lot more gear than I do because his cameras are bigger, better, fat, like Steve Austin, the $6 million man. Uh, <laughs> we're carrying a lot of a lot of gear with us, extra batteries, solar chargers. I mean, I went on a camp out in October, and I probably carried an extra 15 pounds just of battery, solar charger, backup camera, and just incidentals that I needed uh, to go out there and do. Uh, I know when I drive to the mountains, uh, some – in film videos, mm -hmm. I'm filling up my Jeep Wrangler just with camera tripods. You know, I have the GoPros and all the other things that I'm bringing on top of my backpack loadout for hunting and doing whatever I'm doing out there. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's a lot of weight. It is. And, um, you know, in the beginning of all this YouTube stuff, I carried my work camera, which is about, you know, 20 pounds uh, with one battery, and then an extra battery is 5 pounds, and the tripod is 20 pounds. So that's 45 pounds of stuff with just one camera. If I wanted to do two cameras, that's another, I don't know, 20 pounds or so. Um, but I switched to having one smaller camera with the microphone system, and that is about 10 pounds. So I've... You know, for big projects, like when I really want to show something, 
I'll take about 45 pounds worth of gear into the woods. Sometimes it does take me one or two trips to go up the mountain, but um, the the payoff to be able to show a lot of detail to someone is is huge. And here's my dog. <laughs> Marie's pushing hard in the comments for us to do the navigation videos. She, okay. said, she says that uh, all she can find is old ones on YouTube. Yeah, and when I do it, I want to make sure that I have a good location that has a lot of good landmarks so that I can show people. And, um, and one of the things that I think is unique about my channel is I try to make these professional videos. And it's going to be pretty hard-pressed to find something current that is good that's free because um, a right. lot of people are in it for profit. And, and that's a big thing about this channel and, and why I do it is, you know, I grew up poor. You know, I couldn't afford to go to survival school. I couldn't afford to go to all these camps where people would start showing you stuff. Um, and you're really lucky that you had the Boy Scouts, but I never had the Boy Scouts because it w a lot of it was, you know, you needed a father to help you do these things. So I want to be able to show people these things for free and make it really accessible for people. Um, and, and sometimes it takes a lot of time because I have a lot of commitments for work because I am a cameraman, you know, for a living. And so it, it might take, you know, a few months to get something, but when I have an idea, they're in the hopper and it's just, you know, whenever things align that I'll press go on it and start recording. Now, uh, just me two thirty four has a question. It says, would you guys ever consider or already have plans to do a collab video? Yeah, I think we've been talking about some stuff. Yeah, uh, some little insider information. Uh, yeah, we we've been talking about it. the The hardest thing is, he's up in Seattle and I'm in San Diego, but uh, we're we're trying to work out some of the details on on that. So, preferably you come up here because you know with the restrictions and stuff you guys have, I try not to go down to California. <laughs> I think the last hangout we we had, you asked us what our our cap was on magazines, and yeah. you said something like, "Is it seven or ten like we have?" And I'm like, "Cap, you Ouch. can have a round drum and it's fine," you know. Ouch. Um, but, <laughs> But I think if you came up to Washington, we could have a lot of fun. You know, I got, you know, my desert land that we can blow stuff up at. We have beautiful mountains. We got elk. I think we have mountain lions, which I don't really want to play with, but it's an option. So well, we got them down here. Wow. We got the big cats down here too. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping to catch one on video one day. I've seen, I've had three big cat encounters uh, over the years here in San Diego. But uh, I want to catch one on video. I mean, that would be awesome, and I would definitely love to share it with the folks out there. Yeah. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll have plans to do more live uh, streaming uh, in the future. It all depends on how interested folks are, and when we post this video uh, on uh, on Andy's site, you know, how many views he gets out of it. But uh, if you folks want it, you know, we'll try to do our best to uh, to do stuff and get information out there for you. Yeah, we actually get along, so that's pretty good. <laughs> now, uh, if folks, I don't know how many folks are going to be in Vegas during SHOT Show or have the ability to go, you're going to be in SHOT Show. Can right. you give the folks some details about that? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to be going a day before SHOT Show early. And uh, I, uh, I plan on going to the media day, so, you know, checking out the guns, actually shooting them, and uh, having a little bit of fun there, which I think in years past it's been bitter cold and windy, but uh, it should be pretty fun nonetheless. And uh, I'm going to be there covering a lot of different companies like I did last year. I think last year I made, like, 29 videos or something like that. And so uh, I'm going to be doing that again this year. This year I have a really good friend of mine who actually went to film school with me and uh, is a captain in the, uh, in, the, in the U.S. Air Force. So he's going to be with me filming to get, you know, extra coverage, to get those close-up shots of the product details. And this year I'm really blessed to have a sponsor help me out. So I actually get to eat. I'm not going to have to 
heat up MREs and you know some restaurant, uh, not restaurant, but uh, hotel, you know, sink, and uh, let me concentrate a little bit more on stuff. I'm actually going to be spending a lot of time also at the top booth because they're going to have a display of my knife there to uh, to talk about to media and and to anyone else that wants to stop by. But uh, yeah, I should be there the entire time. It's pretty action packed with a bunch of different stuff. So if you guys have any companies specifically that you want me to go visit and see if they have anything new, um, let me know. I'm always happy to do that. Sometimes um, a company doesn't really want to talk to me because I'm not, you know, like a nut and fancy or something like that. Um, but uh, but a yeah. lot of companies are really yeah. receptive. You're not a nut and fancy yet. I don't, you know, I don't want to, be, I don't think I want to be a nut and fancy. Um, you know, because he gets a lot of flack from people. Because right oh, now, yeah. right now, I have like the best subscribers ever. They're they're everyone's nice. You know, they they, you know, chase off trolls from my videos. It's it's pretty awesome. But um, you know, and and so I don't really want that to change. But things inevitably will. Yeah, you know that's unfortunate. The broader scale that your channel gets. Uh, I've been pretty blessed too with uh, just a great w posse of subscribers. I mean, it's like an extended family uh, for me, you know. And what I try to do is, when folks leave a comment, I try to leave a personalized comment. As the channel's growing, though, it's getting harder to do because a lot of folks think that this is a full-time endeavor for some of us folks, and it's not. You know, we have a real job to pay the mortgage, to put food on the table, and it's that work-life balance, right? You know, you, like my wife uh, gave me this. You know, I've been married 27 years. Happy wife, happy life, right? You want to make sure the wife's happy. You got to have that balance. So, you know, you try to get the video videos out when you can. I try to stick to a schedule, but sometimes. It's as Andy can tell you. It's tough. I, you know, he's on the road. He's doing things. You know, uh, I I have a career that sometimes it's tough. We're working long hours, but you know, we do the run. I do my running gun videos. Just slam them out and try to get them to you folks. And uh, as long as you folks keep watching, I'll try to keep getting them out there. Uh, I appreciate all all you subs supporting us, watching the videos, commenting. You know, it's it, it's great. It's fun for me, and that's what motivates me and keeps me going. Because I meet great people, like we have in the chat right now. I mean, it's it's awesome. It's amazing that we can meet electronically like this and talk. Where could just a couple of years ago we couldn't do that. Yeah, I mean, it's all satellites and ones and zeros flying through the air. It's nuts, big time. Big time. Yeah, and that that work life ratio type thing is and it kind of wears down on me because you know my job is being a cameraman and like right now I'm doing you know a bunch of videos for the company that makes these Lionheart Industries and you know sometimes these projects depending on how big they are they might span two three weeks and it's, it's really hard to um, one get the energy but two get the time to go out and do what I actually like to do so um, but you know the more people that subscribe and, and help me out, it, it actually does make give me more time to go and do these things on YouTube. So uh, I really appreciate what everyone does for me on the channel. Uh, Knife and Gun says, don't be a nut, please. <laughs> like a nut and fancy? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, uh, we, we all have our styles. You know, Andy, you have your style. I have my style of videos. And I think that's what's appealing to folks. I, I, the last thing I want to do is try to come off that I'm something that I'm not. What, what you see right here, me sitting in my home, this is who I am day in and day out. Just like I've gotten to know Andy uh, over the course of uh, our YouTube endeavor. I mean, we're, we're trying to keep it real because that, that's only going to last for so long, and then that's when the problems start on your channel. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to waste my time being something that I'm not. You know, I'm already wasting time doing work for companies and that sort of thing, not doing what I 
I mean, it, it, I work with companies that I like and, and they have similar values, but, you know, at the end of the day, I just want to be camping and walking around and, and, and doing a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, and I put my real name out there. I don't hide behind, you know, a name like nothing fancy or anything like that. So I try and be genuine. You know, if I get death threats, that's, you know, that's their problem. Um, I'm not going to cower in a hole or anything like that. So everything that I say, everything that I am is, is pretty genuine. Um, and I think being yourself is the only way to go. It's what I've been doing my entire life, and I don't ever plan on doing anything different. And Jess Me made a comment. He says, uh, great chat, guys. Definitely should do more often and have certain topics. Sure. What, uh, what do people want to hear next time on the chat? Probably within a month or so. That would be something like if uh, if folks that if if they're watching live or if they're watching this after, maybe put on our Facebook pages or send us a, a you know private message or something. Now everything's all Google Plus and that it's so hard to answer comments. So if folks, if you're watching this and I haven't answered a comment, it's because of the damn Google Plus the way they set up the mailbox. It, it's pretty tough now to it's it's gotten a little bit better they did a little bit of fix but it's still a pain in the butt trying to uh, respond to a lot of the questions and comments especially if the folks aren't on Google Plus oh well, yeah totally Just yeah and it it's, uh, you know Google's filled with a bunch of really smart people that get paid way more than I do but I'm not sure like where that came around where they make things more complicated and and less efficient. But, you know, like you said, we both have Facebook. I both, I think we both have Twitter and Instagram, right? So yeah, you guys can, you know, follow us there. There's a lot of things that I post on Facebook that, you know, I don't have time to do a video for. So it's, it's definitely a way to keep up to date. And also I do like mini giveaways on Facebook too. Like this last one, uh, I partnered with Locksack. You know, they wanted to get a few subscribers going their way. So, or, or likes going their way. So I, you know, put that up, and they actually gave away two packages to uh, to two followers. So, yeah, I know. I, I I was looking at those, and I was thinking of the applications that could be used for that. Because I always buy these big, like seal type, water type, bomb proof sacks. The only thing is, when you're backpacking, ounces lead to pounds, and pounds lead to a very tired John out on the trail. Right, and. Uh, you know, those lock sacks, I'm, I was thinking of those going, damn, you know, you could vacuum seal down some clothes, pop it in something like that. I mean, it's there's a lot of good applications for those, and they're, they're not just some cheap-ass Ziploc bag. No, and they're, it's, they're pretty it's tough. Hard to, it's hard to show people, you know, because people could be like, oh, well, you're not, you know, doing it the same for both ones. But, I mean, the, the difference between a Ziploc bag and a lock sack bag is so huge. It's, it, you know, and the cost for lock sack bags are not expensive. And for me, cost is a big thing. Um, but when it comes to important equipment like a knife, boots, socks, a bag, that sort of thing, I'll, I'll pay mountains for it. You know, yeah. have, uh, you know I, I, I get a lot of, a lot of folks ask me about, like, my gear test, and they go, well, sometimes most of your ratings are four, you know, because I do my one to five star, no BS rating on there. And, mm -hmm. you know, they go, well, you know, you don't do a lot of low ratings. And I, and I think, I was thinking about this the other day as I was driving home. I go, it's because I don't like to showcase gear that's crap to folks. Right. I like to showcase stuff that's, affordable for the common man. Times are tough. Folks are working hard for their money. And I try to find things to stretch that dollar um, that's value, quality, that you're going to be able to use it more than once or twice and then it's going to work. And if I use it and it's like a number two rating, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to embarrass a company on YouTube. I'm just not going to showcase it. I mean, I've had companies approach me like that, and I was like, eh, I don't want to show the viewers that. I just don't. Yeah. But uh, no, when I saw that Locksack video, I was like, damn, i got to get me some of those. 
they're pretty nice. And it's the same thing with me when I do review. Um, I have been asked to do some like uh, mediocre products, and and for me, it's uh, you know I don't really mind kind of company shaming, I guess, because they, I mean, it, it, feedback is feedback, and they should take it to heart to improve the next generation of whatever they're making. But for me, it's a big time commitment, and right. you know, I everything I test, I test you know before I even break it out and make sure that it works well. And if it doesn't work well, then I don't know if I want to, you know, lug that 45 pounds of gear up a mountain and, and do a, a test on it, you know. So I want to show people things that would actually benefit them, something that I actually need, and uh, hopefully an improvement on the status quo. Now, we just had Jim Sear enter the channel. He's uh, I've been a sub of his channel for a long time, and I think he's a sub on my channel. Uh, Marie, if you might want to sub Jim's channel because he does a lot of good navigation videos. I think he lives either up in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia, and uh, he he does some good videos on navigation up there. He's he's a good solid guy to to watch his videos on that stuff. Wonderful. See, Jim, you showed up. We gave you a shameless plug for your channel. <laughs> Free of charge. <laughs> Free of charge. No, no problem. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good to see other YouTubers coming in. Like yeah, that. definitely. And hopefully, yeah, uh, you know, if we do more chats, um, you know, we can have what up to ten people on a panel on one of these hangouts. Is that what it is? That's pretty. Yeah, I think I've I've been on some that's had at least ten. Wow. So maybe we can get like a. Uh, an all-star lineup, or you know, if we do YouTube enough, we can do a, a "Where Are They Now?" has been show or something. <laughs> Who knows? You know, it, it, folks, I I like to keep things funny and play around a little bit, you know, because life's too short to be taken serious. Right. But uh, you know, it's a pleasure seeing somebody like Jim popping in, uh, watching. I really appreciate that. Thanks for the support. Absolutely. And that's what I'm. That's what we're talking about. You know. Part of the, the bushcraft, fieldcraft, that outdoor community, uh, there's so much support from viewers watching, subscribers watching. I've learned so much from folks where I posted a video and folks will do a comment and go, you know what, I didn't know that. And I learned something. And we're all learning together of having fun. It, it's a great community that we're in. We don't have a lot of the inroad fighting that a lot of the other – not outdoors community, but a lot of the other YouTube communities have where they have a lot of problems, people coming in, acting crazy, and doing things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see a lot of that on in the community that that we're in, the outdoor, the gun, the knives, the, the uh, tactical stuff, the uh, navigational stuff. You know, I, I don't see that. And that's yeah, fun. It's also a thing where I think we understand that we can share subscribers, you know? Like, there are some people that are really great at some things and other people that are really great at other things. And and so together, it's just this big web of stuff and information and, you know, even, you know, different skills and different regions, too. Like, you know, you're in pine tree forests and that sort of thing. I'm in cedar tree com uh, country, you know, a lot of evergreen trees and you know, like Dave Canterbury, he has hardwood forests over in Ohio and stuff like that, which I visit sometimes, but um, just all these places. And so you got all this information, all these different people, all these different skills and different personalities. And, uh, you know, some people won't jive with some people's, you know, uh, teaching skills where they'll really work with other people. So um, it's not like we're all trying to get out the most awesome cat video, you know, on the internet. We're all doing something. <laughs> or, or crying, uh, uh, leave Britney alone. Yeah. yeah. You know, maybe... Leave we, Britney alone! Yeah, I'm trying to find another sneezing panda to get out there, but, you know, they're <laughs> really hard to find. They're just not reproducing like they used to. <laughs> so. You know, the, the thing is, though, Andy, I would take, you know... 500 loyal subs watching the videos over a viral video any day. Mm -hmm. You know, because of that personal connection, like, 
Marie and Just Me, uh, 234, and Knife and Guns and the folks talking. I mean, these are folks that we're talking to on Google Plus or on our Facebook pages, and we're building those relationships. Yeah, we, we don't have that physical connection, but we're, we're talking and we're exchanging ideas, and it's it's great. It's an awesome media. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I see this being the future. I mean, people are leaving TV left and right. This is awesome. We can have a live chat like this. Yeah, and it's something that definitely wouldn't have been possible just even a few years ago. No. And, uh, you know, I, I hope to get enough time and uh, resources, I guess, to even do, like, a small survival series on YouTube. Um, you know, I definitely have the terrain for it. I've got the cameras for it. Um, I just got to stop getting jobs. You know, I got to start being more unemployed than employed. <laughs> well, that's not necessarily a bad thing, though. No. Yeah, you know, especially in this economy. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I maybe uh, I can find a Southwest Airline ticket and come up and hang out with you for a survival camp out or something. That would be cool. Yeah, yeah. like if I've gone wrong or something like that. You, uh, you young guys, got to be easy on the uh, on the old guy, though. Don't worry, we're not. It's not like we're going to have backpacks or anything like that. We're going to be going. Oh pretty gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't need any carry-on luggage, huh? No. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> you know, just maybe to bring your knife. You can even ship that prior. I might, I might wind up shipping that. You know, who knows? The baggage handlers will take it out of your, you know, luggage. It's yeah. Crazy. So far, I've been really lucky about that stuff, but. Um, you know, I know a lot of people that have bench maids, spider codes, that sort of thing, just zoink, right out of their bag. Yeah, see, that's messed up. Uh, you know, if it can happen, it will happen, unfortunately. Yep, and TSA has lost more bags since 9-11, and, and the, form, or the airlines have lost more bags since the TSA has been formed. And it's, Man, you know, we, we could have a show just on that. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Which is why I did, like, that article on TSA allowed carry-on items that would help you in a survival situation um, so that if you are only going with the carry-on, not checking any baggage, or you want to have a backup to what you've checked on, it's a good idea. So, Really? I, I haven't flown since then. What, what are they allowing you to carry now? Bic lighters, believe it or not, they allow you to carry those on. Um, they allow you to carry, you know, small lithium batteries for, um, for flashlights, that sort of thing. They allow you to carry duct tape Cordage. Uh, I have. Where is it? Here it is. Like something like this. Uh, this Leatherman tool has no knife on it, but it has you know full-on pliers, has a small pair of scissors, and uh, has a small file on it, which are good for nails. It also has sort of like a shape tip, so you can use it as a screwdriver. So something like this, you know, while Obviously, I'm going to prefer, like, the Tahoma Field Knife. Having something like this is going to get you through pretty much anything you need, you know, immediately while you're in an airplane. Right. So, pretty awesome tool. What's the retail on something like that? Um, I think I paid somewhere around $20 for this. And surprisingly, for something so small, they really have tight tolerances and really good construction. It's not just like a piece of metal that's bent and, you know, put a screw through. It's actually really good. I mean, these are even spring-loaded, you know. It's uh, it's pretty nice. And the TSA people seem to like it a lot, too. They look at it, you know, I tell them, like, hey, there's no knife on I was like, yeah, I know, I'm just checking it out. It's freaking cool. So. The, the only Leatherman item that I've ever had an issue with, and it has my channel name on it, is the Wingman. Oh, no. With the... Uh, with the pair of uh, dikes in there, they just don't they don't pinch. So when you say you're cutting a coat hanger or cutting wire, it smashes it. It doesn't just shear it off. That's sad. But you have to think though, for twenty five bucks, right? You're getting what you pay for. Now I have the super tool, outstanding. I mean quality. I mean just five star all the way. Mm -hmm. uh, the wingman for 30, 25 30 bucks I'd still get it. I mean, it's not a deal breaker on the wire cutters. I, when's the last time I cut wire? I mean, maybe a zip tie. 
but you know you're definitely going to get what you pay for but I always tell folks at least get some piece of gear and as your skills progress as you get more confident in using something then you know what you like then you can get that that uh, you know Leatherman Super Tool 300 or whatever yeah, and I'm, I'm guilty of, you know, biting off more than I can chew. I think my first expensive knife was a Benchmade Model 42, and sweet knife, $200, titanium handles, Bali song, but uh, the metal on it was not good, and I wasn't smart enough at that time to know, like, yeah, 420 steel kind of sucks. But, um, you know, nowadays you wouldn't even consider spending, you know, $200 on a knife with 420 stainless steel. Now they have 154 CM, which is a lot better choice. So, well, now we now we have the Tahoma that we can take out in the woods. Yeah, yeah. So you know, if I if I never see a penny for, from this design, you know, I'm going to be happy because I just wanted the design out there that would serve someone well that they're not going to regret later on that they're not going to, you know, be shaking their fist up the heavens if they're in a sticky situation wishing that they, you know, chose a different knife. So um, it was just kind of a, I guess, a service to my younger self, I guess, to make a knife that worked well that I would enjoy. Well, we saw the evolution of it when you showed the drawing and then the cardboard cutout and then explained how you started in school. I mean... You see that progression of where you came from and, and the journey to where that end product is. And uh, that's been a pretty awesome, pretty awesome journey. Yeah. And like the you fact know, you were cutting uh, uh, spring steel, that's, <laughs> that's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, I was a, a little kid. I mean, I'm, you know, five foot tall little guy with like a bench grinder and, you know, a, a saw trying to cut through this stuff is a kind of a sight to see. But, you know, I tell people, you know, if you see a turtle on the top of a fence post, if you didn't get there alone, there's a lot of people that helped me get to where I am. Um, Tops Knives has been... Text message. Uh, Tops Knives has been really uh, accommodating and getting all the features that I really wanted on this knife, and um, all the subscribers helped me get coverage and um, really help push this thing forward. So it's really a thank you to, to everyone that has been around me to get this thing out. No, I yeah, I I can't wait till uh, folks get it in their hand and start using it. You know, I think they're going to be uh, one amazed and surprised. Uh, like we said earlier, I I'm a big fan of having three sixteenths of an inch blade. And Tops is really did a turnaround with their mindset because they're filling that void in that in the in the bushcrafting fieldcraft community, right? Mm -hmm. Where they were primarily tactical operator type knives, you know, mm -hmm. the Baghdad Bullet. I mean, they they got a ton of them, you know. And I've got, like I showed earlier, a bunch here. Uh, now, you know, with the advent of the Brothers of Bushcraft Knife, and they've seen the success of that, I think that's going to open the door, you know, for your knife as well, that it's making people take a look. Hey, they're offering now Bushcraft and Fieldcraft Knives. You know, mm -hmm. I need to take a second look at Topps Knives. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I have had questions, you know, is my knife better than the Brothers of Bushcraft Knife? And honestly, I can't tell you whether it's good or bad. They're two completely different animals. Um, yeah. You know, if you're into literally, like, making bushcraft, then you might like the Brother Bushcraft knife. It carves really well, have a lot of control, um, but, you know, if you're going for one knife to do pretty much everything you want to do um, for most of the seasons, then I would definitely choose a fieldcraft knife. And, and one thing about this knife is, you know, I consider it like a... Um, basically five, six year type knife, uh, season knife, because I want to make sure that, you know, you're, you got your bases covered, and this is a knife that will handle pretty much everything uh, except for, like, the dead of winter, where you would definitely want to have an axe to produce 
enough wood to get you through the night. So, you know, I'm not going to lie and say this is the only thing you're ever going to need, because if you're in a northern forest, middle of winter, you're going to want to have something uh, as a companion, like a, a forest axe or something like that. So, um, yeah, because I think lying to people is going to be a disservice. But, um, yeah, it's you just... Know, and I, I've said in a lot of videos that I'm not a big fan of batoning with my blade. You know, I... Growing up as a kid in northern Maine, my grandfather was a Canadian old-school logger. I mean, born in 1900. And, man, if you ever beat on a, on your knife, I mean, he would have slapped the back of my head. What are you doing, son? You know, that's why we have hatchets. That's why we have axes. Uh, it really wasn't until I started watching YouTube videos on bushcraft and things like that where I saw people batoning with their blades, and I was like, oh, my God, you're beating on a blade. Uh, for me, my my personal opinion, which means nothing to anybody, you know, would be <laughs> I would only do it in a survival situation where that was the last resort, and I had to bang on that blade. You know, I it's I just wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, everybody has different thoughts. I mean, the bush bushcrafting community is very set in the old ways, and that's fine. That's fine. There's a place for that. Uh, the survival communities the same way. Uh, I could see your knife deploying with folks. I mean, I could see it as an operational tactical knife too. You know, three sixteenths of an inch is is definitely enough beef on that blade, where it could be an operator blade taking that to Afghanistan, Iraq, or wherever the heck else we're gonna go. You know, who knows nowadays? Mm -hmm. But. Uh, you know, I, I could see that being a crossover between survival and tactical blade. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, I, I've already cut the head off a deer, so I'm sure I could do the same thing to a similar-sized creature like a human. Um, and, and, and again, this, this knife was really designed to keep my weight situation down when it came to bringing a camera into the field because, like I said, 45 pounds just right. for one main camera is pretty substantial so uh, for me it, it was you know bringing an axe wasn't an option because I would add another couple pounds to my already heavy pack and you know so I, it, I think it does a pretty good job and I, I've already had a lot of comments saying that yeah it would be a great you know tactical um, knife only problem is we're gonna have to get some black handles or something like that on it right Hey, uh, let's see. We have Amateur Prepper checking in. Thanks for coming in, Amateur Prepper. He says, just got off work. Glad I could catch this. Uh, says a Dahoma looks like a great big knife. And it is. It is. It's what, thir 13 inches, a little over 13 inches? Uh, just under 14 overall. So that's, I mean, that's pretty close to the size of my, uh, my Hawks Hellion. Yeah. And I... You know what? I love I love the size of that knife. You know, it, and Ron Hood had a saying about he was asked about big knives because he was a big fan of big knives, and I, I followed Ron Hood for a lot of years. Um, you know, he always said a big knife can do a small task, but a small knife can't do a big task. And I mean, he had a lot of experience out in the woods. I mean, a yeah. lot of years. So I have to respect that. Yeah, we're following in his footsteps. He was a pioneer. Yeah, I, God, I'm not even worthy to stand in the the man's shadow. That he he forgot more of bushcraft and survival than I I would ever be able to learn in my lifetime, because he was able to go out and live that day after day after day. I mean, being a teacher at a university afforded him a lot of time that folks just don't have anymore, and that and he was able to make that video series and pass that that knowledge on to folks for future generations. I mean, that's just awesome. Those are gold bars of knowledge right there. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of respect for that guy. Hey, Knife and Guns has a question. says, any more hints at the next blade you're working on? So somebody's trying to get a sneak peek out of you here. All right. Well, then this is probably a good thing to close on. Um, you know, it's... Uh... How do I say this without giving away too much? I 
I wanted to make sort of a system of knives or tools that you could use. Um, and it's it's based on a very traditional design of Native Americans. And, um, you know, with this knife, it's really going to be sort of the food side of things where, you know, you're processing animals, you're uh, cutting vegetables, you're, you're flushing and doing all this stuff. So it's going to be a really good uh, companion for this knife, which is really going to be for your elbow grease type jobs where you want to put in a lot of um, power and that sort of thing. Not saying that this knife is not good for that, because it definitely is. I've already used it in the kitchen. But this knife is uh, traditionally designed for these sort of in-camp chores. Um, and uh, it's going to probably have the same finish as this knife possibly will have a G10 handle. I'm kind of debating on that because it's going to be used for a lot of game processing and that sort of thing, and G10's just slightly easier to clean because it's not, uh, you don't have the fibers of micarta to have to clean out. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's all I can really tell. I don't want to give too much away. Hopefully you'll see something within the first quarter of 2014. See, but... now for food safety, G10 would be awesome. Exactly, and that's and that's a process, uh, something that I would use, you know, that thing for. And and these are all things that I really try and balance in my head. Well, what's the benefits of this versus right. the cons of this? And so, um, I really try and think backwards on on things in that sort of sense. So, you know, I think about how I'm going to maintain it, and then figure out how I'm going to use it, and then figure out, you know, the the steps before that. So. Well, we, we've gone through an hour and a half already, and it seemed like we just started five minutes ago. Yeah, we'll leave the, the rest for next time, next month. Most definitely. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for asking all your questions. I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank all my subscribers for really helping uh, this channel along and, and uh, really having a lot of interest in this knife. I'd like to thank Wingman for helping moderate the questions because... Lord only knows I can't read and talk at the same time. And, uh, <laughs> anything else you'd like to say? No, I, I just want to say thank you to everyone for uh, checking in on the live chat. Uh, I want to thank folks in advance if you're happy to watch this on Andy's channel uh, after we uh, post this up. I want to wish uh, everyone a happy holidays and a safe holidays. And I want to thank Andy for having me on uh, as like a guest type moderator. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to do more in the future. Awesome. Oh, yeah, and thank you, Tops, of course, for making this all possible. And, you know, check out their uh, their website and their new item section. Mine actually should be right at the top. So, as always, take care out there, folks. Until next time. Bye, folks.